everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, as Abby mentioned, I'm a wildlife ecologist and I'm based out of Seattle, Washington. So it's bright and early here on the West Coast and I'm excited to talk about mammals and talk about some of the ways that wildlife ecologists and wildlife biologists monitor, monitor mammals um, and kind of what we can learn from that type of data and then answer some questions that you guys might have. Um, and as we go along, some of you guys probably are familiar with this, but go ahead and drop questions in the chat section. And I think Abby will keep an eye out and I'll keep an eye out on the chat section. Also, if you guys have questions as I'm kind of talking at you. Um, and so as Abby mentioned, I'm a wildlife ecologist and I'm also a science communicator here in Seattle. Um, and prior to the stay at home order here in Washington, I was working at the Burke Museum here on UW campus. Um, and one of my favorite parts of working at the Burke was getting to interact with guests and talk to them about mammals um, and about some of the really cool mammal research that's happening right now. And places like the Asheville Museum of Science and like the Burke are unfortunately temporarily closed to the public. So I'm, I'm really excited to get to kind of take this to the internet um, and talk to you guys virtually about mammals. Um, and so my research in grad school was up in Alaska, as Abby mentioned, and I'm going to share my screen really quick and show you guys where in Alaska my research was. So just bear with me for a quick second. <clears throat> oh, Abby, could you um, enable the sharing, screen sharing thing? It's just saying I can't. Cool. Thank you. Okay, let's see. So my research was up in Glacier Bay National Park and I have a quick map pulled up here. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see this. I'm gonna zoom out so that everyone can kind of get an idea of where we are in the world. So here we have the US, zoom out a little more. So, okay, we have North Carolina over here. I am up in Washington on the other side of the country and up in Southeast Alaska, kind of in this chain of islands is Glacier Bay National Park. So I'm just gonna zoom in a little. Here's Juneau right over here to the east and I'm gonna turn on the satellite view so you guys can get an idea of what Glacier Bay really looks like. Okay, so here we are. Glacier Bay is this Y-shaped fjord right here. And it, this white that you see around it is ice and snow and glaciers. And so what makes Glacier Bay so special is that these glaciers, not that long ago, actually extend, covered this entire area. So this bay didn't exist that long ago. Um, and so there's now the glacier has receded and this whole area is opened up. And it's a really, really cool place to study wildlife for a couple of different reasons. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now, but that's where Glacier Bay is. Um, and the work that I was doing there had kind of two different aspects. So I had two big main questions that I wanted to understand. Um, the first question that I wanted to ask was what impact do tourists have on mammals here in Glacier Bay? So the mammals that I was really focusing on for this part of my research were bears, brown bears, black bears, wolves, and moose. And so these animals are kind of the characteristic Alaskan mammals that people would come to Glacier Bay really excited to see. And I wanted to know if the bears and the wolves and the moose were excited to see the people or not. So did they want to see people? Did they try to avoid people? And that was one of the questions that I wanted to ask. And the second question that I wanted to ask was, where are all the different mammals in Glacier Bay? How can we find them? Where are they most abundant across Glacier Bay? And so these two different questions required two different strategies of collecting data. And so wildlife ecologists have these huge, big questions and we have to figure out how to answer them. So how do we figure out where mammals are in a huge national park? How do we figure out um, when they're most active or how they're using their space? And so there are kind of two general ways that we can monitor mammals. And those are grouped into two categories. So we have invasive 
monitoring techniques and non-invasive monitoring techniques. So if you are using an invasive technique, that simply means that you are directly handling an animal. And if you're using an uh, indirect non-invasive sampling method, that means you're not actually interacting with an animal at all. And so my research in Glacier Bay used both. And so I have, I brought a bunch of gear with me today and I'm gonna show you guys some of the different ways that I answered these questions using both invasive and non-invasive techniques. So the first one that I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna scoot this back a little so that you can see, is this remote camera. So this is actually one of the exact ones that I used in Glacier Bay. It still has my National Park Service tag on it. Let me tilt this down a little. And so remote cameras are super popular in wildlife ecology. Um, a lot of studies use these for a couple of reasons. So I'm gonna take it out of its box. Right now it's in a security box. So you just open it up. And these boxes are awesome. They protect against theft, which does unfortunately happen sometimes. Sometimes people will steal cameras. And so these boxes are great because you can uh, lock them up. But we actually use them in Glacier Bay to protect against mammals. So when you put out something like a remote camera in a really remote area that doesn't see a lot of humans, that wildlife are gonna be curious. They're gonna wanna know what it is. They're gonna come up to it. They're gonna smell it. And the bears really loved to kick our cameras around. So we put them in security boxes to protect the actual camera. So this is what a pretty typical wildlife camera or remote camera looks like. And you can just open it up and you see that there are places for a battery, turn it on and off, and you just set them up and you can leave them for weeks at a time. So this is a great non-invasive way to monitor wildlife. And I see there's a question here in the chat that says, is it true that black bears can climb trees? That is absolutely true. They are, they are great climbers. Um, brown bears can climb trees as well. And when I say, let me kind of back up. When I say brown bears, I mean, this, it means the same thing as grizzly bears. So they are the same species. Um, I use brown bear because brown bears are coastal grizzly bears. And my research happened on the outer coast of Alaska. So these bears are coastal. Uh, but when I say brown bear, I mean the same thing as grizzly bear. Uh, but yes, brown, uh, black bears are great at climbing. They have claws that are really specialized to climb trees. Um, so that's a great question. Uh, and these wildlife cameras are awesome because they collect a lot of information. So you don't actually have to be there. You can just set them up and then leave and the cameras do all the work. And I'm gonna share my screen again and show you guys just one of maybe a couple um, cool photos that I have. Let's see here, share my screen. So, okay, let me make this larger. So here are just some different uh, wildlife cameras, uh, wildlife camera photos that my cameras took in Glacier Bay. And I'm gonna just open up, I'll open up this one. Okay. Let's see, can you guys see this? I'm going to zoom sharing here. Oh, maybe I can't zoom in. But what I wanna show you guys here is how much information each photo that these cameras takes has. So in this top corner, we have a date that the photo was taken. We also have a time that it was taken. This was taken at 9.49 PM. And then we have this down in the corner is the site that the camera was installed at. So we have a location, we have a date, and we have a time. And it also collects other information like temperature. And you can record whether or not it's raining, stuff like that. And when you get these photos, you're processing them and identifying which species are in them. And so what's really, cool about these cameras is that you get a ton of information and you don't even have to be there with the animals. And so for a question like mine, where I was wondering how humans impact wildlife, this is a great tool to use because if you were actually, if the researcher is there observing wildlife, you might be modifying that animal's behavior just by being there. And so this is a really powerful tool that wildlife ecologists can use to non-invasively study wildlife. And they are both motion censored and heat censored. So when say a brown bear is walking by, your camera is installed right here. The brown bear walks by, as soon as the camera senses that motion, it'll start taking pictures. 
but they also have a heat sensor. So for example, we had two moose brothers that hung out together all summer at one of our sites in Glacier Bay. And they would just lay down in front of the camera and go to sleep. And so the cameras, not sensing any motion, used the heat sensor to take pictures instead. And so mammals are warm blooded. And so these cameras can sense when the heat signature of the environment is changing. And when a warm blooded animal is in front of it, they will also take pictures. So they're really, really cool tools that wildlife ecologists can use to study animals. And they're great for large mammals. So this is what I used to study brown bears, black bears, wolves, and moose. Um, let's see, and there are also, there are other ways that we can non-invasively study animals. Oh, I see a question here. This is a great one. How did you decide where to put up cameras and how many to put out? This is a question that wildlife ecologists really struggle with. The ideal situation is that, is that you have an infinite number of cameras that you can put out because that means your chances of detecting an animal on one of these cameras goes up. Um, unfortunately, they're really expensive. And so a lot of the time wildlife ecologists, their studies are kind of constrained by how much money they have. So the first thing that you have to take into account is how many cameras can you afford to buy? Um, from there, so we bought 40 of these for my study in Glacier Bay. And we had 10 different sites that we installed these cameras at. So each site had four cameras. And that is a way to make sure that you're, you're capturing as much wildlife activity and space use as you can at each site. And so it's kind of a balance. It's a balance between how many cameras can you afford to buy and what is your question and how much space are you kind of trying to cover. And so for the particular study that I did in Glacier Bay, we picked where to put these cameras based on a couple different things. So one of the things was we wanted to put at least some of these cameras at places where humans went because we wanted to see how humans and wildlife were interacting. And the second part of it was wanting to put these cameras out in places where we knew we would get photos of wildlife. And so this information came from talking to people at Glacier Bay, talking to the native people in the community about kind of where can we expect to see the most wildlife because we want to make sure to put cameras in that particular area. So that's a great question. Um, and there are other non-invasive ways to monitor wildlife. So besides just cameras, you can do things like direct observation. So just going out and watching the animals. And this is great if you are conducting a study about behavior. So if you want to know kind of why animals behave a certain way, getting out there and sitting with them and observing them directly is a great way to do that. Um, you can also conduct sign surveys. So sign surveys are when you are out in the field, out in your study area, uh, walking along your sites and you are looking for signs of animals. So the, the footprints that they leave in things like dirt or sand, you can identify what animal it is based on what their footprint looks like. Also, a lot of the time when animals are walking around, they don't have toilets like we do, they don't have bathrooms. Nature is their bathroom. And so they will poop as they walk. And from that poop, you can identify what animal it was. So these are indirect ways, non-invasive ways to sample or monitor wildlife. Um, and so I'm going to let's see, I want to share some, um, some of these kind of invasive ways to monitor wildlife as well, because they're pretty interesting. And one, oh, I want to touch on one question that I got before we started that I thought was really interesting. Um, let me scroll down to it here. So somebody asked, how do you count or keep track of animal populations? How do you know that you're not counting the same animal multiple times? And this is a great question. And something that wildlife ecologists really have to take into account when they're conducting their research. Because if you say your objective is to um, help the government decide whether or not an animal should be listed as an endangered species, you need really accurate data um, on how many of those, how many individuals of that species there are. And so you need to make sure you're not counting the same individual more than once. And so there are ways uh, mathematically to account for that when you're using stuff like remote cameras. So oftentimes with these cameras, you can't tell 
whether or not you've seen that particular individual before. So animals like bears don't have stripes or spots, so you can't really identify individuals. And so we wildlife ecologists have models that you can build on the computer that account for that. So we can try to estimate how many animals there are uh, without directly tagging them or marking them. And um, one of the ways that really kind of the best way to deal with this, this problem of counting individuals more than once is by directly trapping wildlife. So when you directly trap an animal, you can mark it. And that means, so there are different ways to do this. And I have a couple examples here. Um, if you have a small mammal, I don't know if you guys will be able to see this. This is a little ear tag that you would put on a small mammal. So we use these for things like mice or rats. Um, they don't work great for shrews. Shrews are a little too small, but they do work for things like mice, mouse sized um, animals. And these, each one has an individual number on it. And so from, I'll try to hold it up. This one says eight, seven, six. I don't know if you guys will be able to read that, but when you capture an animal and you tag its ear with one of these little ear tags um, and you're conducting your trapping, if you, if you trap another animal that has an ear tag, you know you've already counted that one. And so marking animals is a great way to know if you've already encountered that individual. And there are different ways to mark them. So ear tags is one way. Sometimes you can use little scissors like this and clip their fur kind of on the back of their neck. And when you capture an animal that has clipped fur, you know that you've already captured it before. Um, and then there are larger uh, ways to mark animals. And I have a couple, a couple really exciting um, things to show you. So this is a coyote collar. So when you capture larger animals, um, a lot of the times you're gonna be doing these in box traps. So they're large traps that the animal, uh, you put bait in them at the back and the animal walks in and the door closes. And from there you can go in and most of the time when you're handling larger animals like a coyote or a bear or a wolf, they will be anesthetized. So they will be very sleepy so that when you go in there and you're collaring them, you don't get hurt and they don't get hurt. But so this is an example of a coyote collar um, and this is a transmitter. So in this little box um, has a bunch of technology that transmits up to satellites so you can actually track coyotes. And this is a great way to know if you see this on a coyote, you know for sure you've already captured it. I see a couple questions coming through. So I just want to make sure I'm looking at these. Uh, let's see. What, oh, this is, a, this is an interesting question. Somebody asked, are you allowed to bond with the animals? So part of wildlife research is, um, that's a great question. Part of wildlife research is being objective. Part of science in general is being objective. So certainly when you're capturing animals and handling them, you want to make sure that you are handling them, processing them, collecting data as fast as possible. You don't want them to be, um, to become kind of habituated to humans. You don't want them to feel so comfortable that they start um, coming into human settlements, stuff like that. So when you're directly handling the animal, it's important that you do that as fast as possible so that you can release the animal and get them back into their everyday life. Um, but with that being said, there are certainly experiences that I've had handling animals or even going through remote camera photos where I recognize the same individual over and over and you start to kind of feel like you have a bond with them even though you're not directly interacting with them. So that's a great question. Um, another question that came in is when you tag or collar an animal, do you just, do you do a percent of them or all of them? That's a great question. Ideally, you'd be able to capture every animal and then you would have all of the information about them. That rarely happens. So what we can do is trap a subset of a population. So say here, I'll give an example. This is, I'll show these here. So this is a small mammal trap. And so these traps will often go with these little ear tags. Remember when I showed these? So small mammals get tiny little ear tags or little fur clips on the back of their neck. These traps, um, you would set them open. So here's the opening. The, in the back, you would put bait. And so for small mammals, you're often using oats, 
seeds. Um, if you're trapping for shrews, you want to include insects because shrews are insectivores, so they eat insects. And you put a little bit of cotton in the back to keep them warm so they can build a little nest while they're in this trap. They have food. And when they walk to the back, I don't know if you can see, but there's a little plate that's sticking up a little bit. And I'll just demonstrate what it's like when the trap closes. So when they walk on that plate, the front triggers and it closes the trap. And now it's closed on both sides. And when you go in there and you get that animal out, that's when you mark it and you collect data on, uh, is it a male or a female? How old is it? Did it recently have babies? Does it have any um, interesting kind of uh, weird skeletal patterns or anything like that. You're collecting as much data as you can on this animal. And you're definitely not gonna get every single mouse in your study area. So what we do is we capture a subset of them. And from that subset, we can make kind of general inferences about the population as a whole. So we can, uh, we call it extrapolate. So we can extrapolate out to the whole population based on some of the trends or the patterns that we are seeing in that subset. And so let's see, I got a question here that says, what is the largest animal I've personally tagged? Um, not a big one. So I think the largest one that I've personally tagged was probably a wood rat. Um, and I have, so in Glacier Bay, we, um, Glacier Bay is a really special park. Um, they are particularly concerned about wildlife there and they don't really allow larger animals to be trapped. Um, so handling large animals in Glacier Bay wasn't much of an option, but here is a wood rat trap. And I'll have to scoot this back a little because wood rats are a little larger. So this is a tomahawk trap. And this is for larger animals like wood rats, think something like a hare, uh, like a large rabbit. That's what we use these traps for. Um, and they work kind of the same as these small mammal traps in that there's a plate back here that they walk on and it triggers the front door to close. So I'll show you what that looks like. You basically just set the trap like this. You can see now the front is open so I can reach back in here. Here is the plate that the animal will walk on. And I'll just demonstrate real quickly what that looks like. Hold it like this. So they walk in, there's bait back here. They step on this little plate and it closes the trap door. And so wood rats are kind of funny because we have devised a special way to get them out of the trap. And here is that very high tech way to get wood rats out. So it's basically just a bag attached to this little wire cone. And what you would do is put it over. So there's a wood rat in your trap. You put the bag over the front like this. And then a funny way that actually works really well to get wood rats. I've never really tried it with other, with other mammals, but it works well for wood rats. You can blow on their rear end as they're in this trap and they don't really like it. And so they'll run into this bag like this. So they'll run into it, their face ends up in here. And then you can kind of tie off this bag. And then what's left is a wood rat whose face is kind of like jammed in here. And so this has holes in it and their ears will actually stick up out of these. And that's great. It's a great way to then go in and ear tag them really quickly. So they kind of give you their ear out of the little metal cage, you ear tag it, and then you go like this and you open the bag and you kind of give them another like blow on their face a little and they will run right out. So it's not a huge animal, but that's probably the largest mammal that I've personally trapped. Um, the lab that I'm in at the University of Washington does a lot of work with elk and deer and wolves. So I also have a wolf collar here and I'll compare it. So just for size comparison, wolf and coyote. So coyotes are much smaller. Here we have the wolf collar and it actually smells horrible. I, you guys can't smell it, but I can smell it and it smells pretty bad. Um, I believe these were on wolves in Yellowstone. Um, and what's really cool about these is they, Basically, you would capture a large animal like a bear or a wolf in a, in a much larger kind of version of this trap. So a really big one that 
that um, once they kind of step on the plate in the back, the trap closes and you can go in and, and work them up. Um, but what's cool about these collars is that when you put them on the animal, this box here transmits a signal um, up to a satellite that you can access that gives you information about uh, location. So where it has basically GPS points that it transmits back to you. So once you release the animal that has this collar on it, it'll run away, it'll do its thing, it's living its life. And every say five minutes or one hour or 12 hours or, or whatever you decide, you'll get a fix. And so that means you will get information on where exactly that animal is, the GPS location of that animal at that time. And I'm looking at these questions here just really quick. Is your job in research ever dangerous? Um, certainly, it certainly is. And particularly if you are trapping larger animals like this. So any work in, you know, the back country where you are kind of regardless of what type of wildlife you're surveying, if you're deep out in the Alaskan wilderness, there are certain dangers that you are gonna, gonna have to deal with. Um, but, you know, we, we work really hard to minimize any potential danger that you would encounter in the field. But when you're working with larger animals like this, it's definitely something that you have to keep in mind. And actually, the number one kind of most dangerous job in wildlife ecology or most dangerous part is flying in a helicopter when you are looking for tagged animals. And so one way that you can tag animals is from the sky. So you can, they have these dart guns that basically have a sedative in the little, um, the little dart that's in them. And so from a helicopter, you can, so these are for larger animals, think like caribou or something like that. You're flying along in the helicopter and you can dart the animal from the air. The sedative gets released into the animal. You land the helicopter, you run up to the animal and you, you put a collar on it or do whatever it is that you need it to do. But helicopters are notoriously dangerous for wildlife biologists. So there are certainly dangers involved, um, as with maybe any job, um, but there are a lot of ways to minimize those dangers. So one of the reasons that we uh, sedate wildlife is to protect us and to protect the animal. Because if the animal is really stressed out in a trap and it's, and it's flailing around, it might hurt itself. And so it's kind of in the best interest of everybody if you're capturing those larger animals to give them some type of sedative. Um, and actually kind of as a side note, I'm thinking about this as I'm saying it, there was a, um, I know somebody who was working on research on uh, brown bears and in order to access the brown bears, he was actually going into their, and I do not recommend this to anybody that is not a trained professional, but it's pretty interesting. Uh, he would actually go into their dens as they were hibernating, he would crawl into their dens and with a little mini syringe gun would inject them with a sedative to make sure that they didn't wake up. Um, and when bears are in hibernation, it's a pretty deep sleep. So most of the time he was able to get in there and give them the extra sedative, no problem. But there was one particular time where he was crawling into this bear den where a bear was hibernating with her cubs and the bear woke up. And so that was a really fast escape for him having to kind of like backtrack out of the hole really quickly. It certainly could have, could have been really dangerous, but you know, he was able to get the sedative into the bear and it was fine, but there are definitely kind of unforeseen challenges that happen when you're doing this type of work. Um, looking at these questions here, does, does the collar get in the way of the bear or wolf's activities? Really good question. So, Obviously, it, it, it will impact the animal in some way. However, there are rules as to how big of a collar you can put on an animal. So the goal is to go for a collar that weighs no more than 5% of the body weight of the animal. So think of it like wearing kind of a chunky bracelet or something like that. It shouldn't be so heavy that when they're walking, it's kind of like dragging them down. Most of the time when you put these on them, you know, I mean, this probably weighs three pounds maybe. So they look pretty big, but they're not, they're not huge. They're not super heavy. And a lot of the time, these collars will have um, a way to, they kind of expand with the animal as the animal grows. And so if you're collaring, 
say like a, a fawn, a baby animal, you put the collar on it and the collar is really small when it starts off because the animal is really small, but it expands as the animal's neck grows and then it will automatically pop off when it gets too tight. And so these are ways that we, you know, different strategies that wildlife ecologists use to make sure that we're not doing um, harm to the animals that we are trying to study. So that's a great question. Uh, let's see here. So anyway, um, wolf collar here. And I just want to quickly show how the tracking works once you've put the collar out. So you've put out a box trap, you've captured a wolf, you've given it some sedatives so that it's not stressed out. You've gotten in there, you've say you've collected some hair from the wolf so that you can run some DNA analyses on it. You've done a full workup of it. You understand that it's a three-year-old female. Um, it hasn't had any pups yet. You can kind of collect all this data from the animal as it's kind of conked out on the sedative. You strap the collar on it and then it, you leave, it runs away and it starts living its life again. Say you want to go find that wolf again or say for some reason the collar has popped off and you need to go find it. That's when the antenna comes into play. So these antennas, this is called an H antenna because it's shaped like an H. These antennas are the receiving end of the transmitter. So this box here is the transmitter. This is the receiving end. So the signal that this caller emits up into space with GPS locations uh, gets picked up by this. So you go out into the field, you have a general idea of where the collar is. This antenna, I don't have a, a receiving end to it, but it plugs into what looks like kind of an old school telephone, like a big kind of block. And you tune the antenna to have the same frequency as the collar. And then you go out in the field and you basically are surveying the area, kind of walking around, um, waving your antenna around, trying to find a signal. And the signal just sounds like beeps. And so when the beeps get louder and faster, that means you're getting close. And so you can use these to hone in on where this collar is or where the animal is. Um, and it works pretty well. It's pretty cool. Uh, there are a couple different types of antennas that you can use, different types of collars. But that's kind of the general way that you would then go in and find an animal or find a collar that's popped off. And so that was one of the questions that came in. Do you recover the collars when they pop off? The hope is yes. Um, again, collars cost a lot of money, so it's great to be able to reuse them. Um, most of the time, it's fairly easy to find them once they have popped off. Occasionally, something might go wrong with the collar, so the battery dies or something like that, in which case you're unable to recover it. But the goal is you put these out and then you get them back at the end of the season. So that's a good question. Uh, let's see here. And I had a couple other questions that were um, submitted ahead of time that I thought were really interesting. Uh, let's see here. So one of the questions that I got that I loved was why do the size, um, why do the size of litters vary so much between mammals? So why do mammals like dogs or cats have so many while humans or elephants have so few offspring? And so this is a really interesting Question, and there are a lot of reasons as to why this is. So I'm gonna give you kind of a general answer. Excuse me. Um, generally, animals can kind of fall into two different categories. So these are called K-selected animals and R-selected animals. And so animals that are K-selected um, are things like, things like humans or elephants. So these animals that are long-lived, uh, they generally only produce a few offspring uh, at a time or in their lives. And um, our selected species are those animals that are often smaller animals and they produce uh, many less well-developed offspring. So think about the difference between a human who is a K-selected species. We live a long time. We only have a few offspring throughout our lives. Most of the time when we give birth, it's only to one offspring at a time. And when, they, when the offspring come out, they're fairly well developed. And then compare that to something like a mouse. It can have a lot of babies all at once. And when they come out, they are basically like helpless little blobs. Um, and so that's kind of the main way that we categorize these animals. And 
you know, there are definitely exceptions to this, um, but that's kind of the general thought. Um, and, and in general, mammals kind of have a little bit of a harder time than non-mammals do. So <clears throat> mammals, when they give birth, they're giving birth to live young. And that means that there's a lot of effort that go, a lot of effort and energy and resources that go into producing a live animal compared to something like a bird or a salamander or a fish, something like a fish who can lay millions of eggs at a time, those eggs are really small and they're not well developed, they're not developed yet, right? So they don't take as much energy to produce. And so <clears throat> that's one of the ways that we kind of generally characterize these animals are selected, producing a lot of babies all at once and case selected, producing much fewer offspring Oftentimes, those case-selected animals like humans, like primates, they have uh, a, they spend a lot of time raising their young. So they're investing a lot of energy once the offspring is born into making sure that it survives. Where things like case, uh, our selected species, like a fish maybe, will kind of lay its eggs and then just bail. And the eggs are left to do their own thing and survive or not. And so because K-selected species, these larger mammals like humans or primates, uh, because they spend so much time and resources producing this well-developed uh, offspring, they spend a lot more time caring for it as it grows up. So that, I thought that was a really interesting question. <clears throat> um, let's see, I also got a question about bears, which I love. Uh, this question was, where else in the world are there big bears like in Alaska? Um, and I'm, I know I'm biased because I spent so much time up there, but I, I think big bears are an Alaskan specialty. Um, I think there are no bears like Alaskan bears, uh, but there are large bears that live uh, ac across Canada, down into British Columbia, down into the Rocky Mountains, so places like Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, uh, Washington, where I live, has a, a couple brown bears left, a couple grizzly bears left, uh, but they also live across Europe in small numbers and across uh, Russia and kind of down into Asia as well. Um, and then there are, of course, polar bears, which live in the Arctic, up in the north, and then one of my favorite types of bears is called a Kermode bear or a spirit bear. Um, and those bears live only in British Columbia. So they're in Canada and they are a subspecies of black bears. So they look like black bears, except they're white and they're really, really beautiful. It's this genetic mutation that they have that makes them white, but they're not albinos. So their eyes have pigment. They have those same dark eyes that a black bear would have, but they have white which I think is really cool. Um, got another question in here. Are there any diseases that you worry about spreading and damaging top predator populations? It's a great question, um, especially kind of in this kind of weird time where we have uh, COVID-19 is spreading and that is a disease that originated in an animal. So there are, are zoonotic uh, diseases and infections. So that means that originates in an animal and it jumps to a human. And those are definitely things that we have to think about. Um, in my experience of handling wildlife, I haven't been too concerned about um, contracting anything from them. So mice in particular can have hantavirus, which is something that humans can get from, I believe it's from, uh, m mice can kind of leave these droppings piles. And um, when the droppings dry, the dust that's generated from them can contain hantavirus. Um, my experience trapping small mammals has been outside and those dust particles don't formulate as well in outdoor environments as they do say in your attic or something like that. So I haven't worried too much about it. And we also do protect ourselves by wearing, uh, we definitely wear gloves when we handle animals. Um, and so I'm not too worried about that. There are definitely diseases. I don't know much about it, but chronic wasting disease is something that can be really harmful for ungulate species. So things like deer and elk and moose. Uh, and I know that's kind of becoming more of a problem than it's been in the past for them. Um, but in terms of actually kind of monitoring these mammals, I'm not too concerned 
personally about my spreading of anything. Um, but there are definitely diseases that are persistent in wildlife that we need to kind of keep an eye on uh, to make sure that they don't get out of control. Um, got another question here that says, you spoke of zoonotic diseases that originate in animals and jump to humans. Are there diseases that you could have that spread to animals that you trap? That's a really good question. And to be honest, I don't know that I have a great answer for it. Um, there are potentially, yes, would be my answer. Um, again, making sure that we use protection when we're handling the animals, I think is the best way to make sure that that doesn't happen, to make sure that we're not giving anything to the animal. And that also is kind of what I was talking about earlier, how important it is to when you're handling an animal to handle it quickly and efficiently and make sure that it is released as soon as possible so that your time spent actually handling the animal is decreased as much as possible. Uh, but that's a great question. Uh, another one here that said, how far apart were your camera trap sites? Um, so this can vary from study to study. In Glacier Bay, my camera trap sites, so we had 10 total sites spread across the bay. Um, and they ranged, there was kind of a range. So they ranged from maybe a kilometer or two away from one another to several kilometers, 10 or 15 kilometers away from one another. And in general, when you're using these remote cameras, uh, ecologists typically would prefer, if it's possible, depending on the landscape that you're trapping in, would prefer to trap in a grid. So that means basically creating a map before you even go out and install these that has a grid pattern of evenly spaced camera traps. Um, and the space that you would want between each trap depends on the animals that you're interested in capturing in these photos. So some animals have huge home ranges. They can cover tens of kilometers a day. So if those are the animals that you're interested in getting photos of, you would put these cameras up um, in a grid formation if you can with you know, a kilometer or two or three or four or 10 uh, between each camera installation so that you're kind of getting a good, a good spread of that whole landscape. And if you're trapping for smaller mammals that have smaller home ranges, the space between those installations will probably decrease. But that's a great question. Uh, this question says, how far apart? Oh, I just read that. What were some of the findings of your study? Um, so we found a couple of different interesting things. In regards to tourism, we found that each mammal that we were studying, so again, brown bears, black bears, wolves, and moose, each animal had a different reaction to humans. So we found that brown bears in Glacier Bay really didn't seem to care. They weren't necessarily attracted to centers of human activity, but they also didn't avoid them. Um, in a place like Glacier Bay, where there really isn't that much human activity, that's not super surprising. So there's no hunting of these bears in the park. The park is huge. So they're not really experiencing too much negative human interaction, um, but they're also not getting any type of real food subsidies. So in a lot of national parks, there will be issues with bears getting into trash cans or kind of raiding campsites and getting food. And that is when you start to see things like habituation happen. So in Glacier Bay, it's so remote that that really isn't much of a problem. And so the brown bears there really don't seem to care when people are around. They don't really wanna be around them all the time, but we don't see them necessarily avoiding humans or being attracted to centers of human activity. Um, wolves, on the other hand, had a pretty strong avoidance reaction to people in Glacier Bay. And this is, this is fairly typical for animals like wolves. So wolves have a really long history of being hunted, um, especially in Alaska, um, but across the United States, we basically wiped out wolves through hunting. And so that knowledge, that fear of humans can be passed down from wolf to wolf, from generation to generation. And so we found that wolves typically fairly strongly avoid centers of human activity in Glacier Bay, which is pretty typical for those, um, for those animals. Moose, we found, tend to be kind of attracted to centers of human activity. And we think this might be because they are prey species. 
So they kind of use humans as a bit of a buffer. They kind of create the safety net around them by being close to humans, knowing that larger predators like wolves don't want to be around people. And then black bears were kind of a mixed bag. They're in the middle. They're not a top predator, but they're not necessarily a prey species. So we found that they are, um, they, they change their activity patterns throughout the day to kind of avoid people. They don't want to be around them so much, but they're actually not moving away from people spatially. So they're staying where people are, but they're just changing their activity patterns to avoid them during the day. So pretty interesting stuff and definitely different results depending on which species um, we were looking at. Uh, let's see another question. How do you know where to put the cameras if you're trying to record a certain animal? That's a great question. Um, and I, this kind of ties into another question that I got sent earlier uh, before we started that was about how we incorporate knowledge from uh, traditional Alaskan communities. So I kind of want to answer this in two ways. So in Glacier Bay, um, we figured out where to put cameras based on a couple of different things. One of those things was talking to community members. So the Clinket people, um, Glacier Bay is their homeland and they have been there much longer than any of my ancestors certainly had been there. And so one of the important things that I think all of wildlife ecology needs to be better at is incorporating this traditional uh, indigenous knowledge into our science because they know the landscape better than any of us. And so one of the really cool and important ways that we can figure out where to go find these animals is by including native people in the discussion. And this is so important because they know, they know Glacier Bay like the back of their hand. And I was kind of coming in as an outsider, not having been there before and trying to figure out where these animals are hiding out. And so that was a really invaluable resource, incorporating traditional knowledge into the science to kind of better the science. And so that was one way that we did that. Another way that you can figure out where to put camera traps is by following the signs. So animals will leave signs. They'll leave poop, like I said earlier. They'll leave these, bears especially will do it. They're so heavy that when they walk, the ground beneath them kind of wears away. So they create these really awesome mark trails, bear mark trails that you can see individual footprints of the bears kind of walking through the woods, which is so cool. And it, and it tells you that wildlife have been there. And so they'll also have things like rub trees. Rub trees are big trees that bears will often go to, but a lot of other mammals will go to. Also, they're kind of like the community uh, cork board, like the message board of the community. All these animals go up to the rub tree and they rub their backs on it. They're scratching on it. It leaves their scent so that other animals can come by, smell the tree, and they have an idea of who's in the area. Um, so oftentimes we would find rub trees that have um, evidence of, of wildlife that have been there, whether that's hair. Um, and you can see the hair on the trees. And when you see that, you know that's a place that wildlife have been and you wanna make sure to put a camera close by. And if you can, put a camera on, the, um, on a tree or a post or a rock facing that rub tree because you know you're gonna get a lot of traffic. So that's a really great question. Uh, looks like we have just a couple of minutes left. There are a few other questions that I got uh, prior to starting. Um, let's see here. Um, I got, one of the questions was, what's your favorite mammal in Glacier Bay and why? And I love that question. Um, and first and foremost, brown bears. Um, there is just absolutely nothing like them. Um, you look at pictures of them online and you can tell how incredible they are and you watch documentaries about them and you can see how smart and curious um, and just powerful they are. But when you see one in person, it's just a totally different experience. Um, really incredible to be in the same space as an animal like a brown bear. Um, but outside of that, there are uh, marmots in Glacier Bay that I find completely fascinating and adorable. Um, marmots are a type of rodent. They're in the same family of squirrels, but they're a little bit larger. They're maybe like this big. And the marmots in Glacier Bay are endemic, which means they are only found in Glacier Bay. And they're the special type of marmot 
that are really dark colored. And I want to share my screen one more time because I actually, I think I have a picture of um, marmots do this thing called boxing. Um, and it's so cute. And I just want to share this picture because I love it. Let's go here. Okay. Um, so this is a picture of marmots boxing. And this is kind of just like a social behavior that they have. It's like playing. And you can see here they are nose to nose boxing like this. And they'll do it quite often. And I think it's adorable. So I really love the marmots in Glacier Bay. And you can see they're really dark colored. Generally, marmots are, are a light gray or a really light tan. And in Glacier Bay, they're melanistic, which means they're almost black. So they're a really, really cool animal. Um, stop sharing my screen now. We have just a couple minutes left. If anybody has other questions, I would be happy to answer them. Um, I am just going to see what other, if I had any other quick ones. Somebody asked if there were any large mammals in Glacier Bay that were going extinct. And I thought that was a great question. In terms of land mammals, uh, no, not to my knowledge. Glacier Bay and Alaska in general is, is known for its wildlife, right? There's so much space for them and it's a really great place for them to live. However, there are some marine mammals in Glacier Bay that are threatened. Their populations are declining. So things like humpback whales or stellar sea lions. And um, somebody asked in the question, what can we do to stop it? And I think kind of maybe this is an appropriate way to kind of end this Ask a Scientist. But uh, in general, I think the best thing that anybody can do is just to be curious. So care about the earth, go outside, experience the earth. And I promise you that if you go and you really experience outside in the wilderness, you will care about it. And that is, I think, a, the best place to start is just get out there, be curious, ask questions. The more time you spend outside, the more you're going to love it and the more you're going to care. Um, and I think I'll probably leave it at that. Thank you guys so much for asking all of these awesome questions. Um, I had a really, really great time talking about them. And I love talking about mammals and I appreciate everybody joining me today and I can hand it back off to Abby. Yeah. So thank you so much, Mira. That was fabulous. Love seeing all the traps. That's really interesting. Um, I will be posting this on the Asheville Museum of Science Facebook page for those of you that had to came in late or had to check out early. Um, and if you have any other questions, you can send them in to any of us at the Asheville Museum of Science. Um, my email is posted all over all of our our social media and websites. Um, so please reach out if you have any additional questions and we will be back again next Friday with another scientist. So thank Thanks. you so much, Mira, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.